Let me introduce our topic and our guest speaker for the evening. Tonight's guest is Yvette Key. Yvette works at Lehigh Valley Health Network's Comprehensive Health Services, where she's a behavioral health specialist. In her role there, she works with transgender individuals by providing supportive counseling, as well as writing WPATH letters of surgical readiness for their transgender patients. She is a member of WPATH and is, a certifi and is certified as a transgender care therapist through the International Transgender Certification Association. She's educated in transgender health as well as transgender behavioral health and works with and supports dozens of transgender clients, something that we are very, very thankful for. So please welcome my friend, Yvette Key. Hey, thank you, Corinne. That was very lovely. Thank you. Um, so today, um, just starting out, are you my ally or my gatekeeper? The ins and outs of hiring and firing a therapist and other cycle babble. Um, it started out with uh, the objectives here, which is identifying a reason for seeking therapy, questions to ask a potentially new therapist, files, fumbles, red flags, and firing a therapist, knowing when the relationship is over or at a dead end, and then some comments on letter keeping, gatekeeping, uh, and becoming an ally. I found this quote. And I, and I should say, by the way, so we're going to post a link to this presentation on our Facebook page tomorrow, if people uh, are interested in downloading it. I'm sorry. That's okay. I found this quote, and I don't know where I found it, but I found it, and I had wrote it down and didn't write, give the person the credit, but I thought it was appropriate to open this session. I feel like trans people have two options. Find the therapist who knows how to do trans stuff but might not be good at addressing mental health issues or you find a therapist who can talk about mental health problems but don't understand what it means to be transgender. So I really like that because it's transgender people have regular problems too, just like everybody else, you know? So they're not always gender focused. So, you know, the importance of being able to access that care no matter who you are. So reasons for seeking therapy, okay? So there's an intrinsic connection between one's mental health and the physical, psychosocial, sexual, cultural, and spiritual aspects of one's health. So, you know, it seems like the mental health holds everything together. So being having good mental health, um, you probably can have some pretty good outcomes on your other areas of life. Okay, so some of the reasons for seeking therapy, okay? And I, I put down some stuff that are like symptoms. And um, I also have some things of like, what are some things you'd like to pursue and see? Do you typically have difficult, difficulties to concentrate or even, even the things you typically enjoy? Does, does life feel like an uphill battle with everything feeling like an effort? Are you frequently worried about things, large or small? Are you feeling depressed more than you are not feeling depressed. You notice you're feeling depressed more than one to two days a week. Do you feel restless or agitated much of the time? Do you find yourself picking fights with people, even those you love and care about? Are you frequently feeling angry? Are you often expressing your angry anger to those around you? Have you noticed changes in eating and sleeping habits? Do you want to find more peace in your life? And some other reasons are some people want to learn some anger management skills, relationship and communication skills, improving self-confidence, emotional responses to triggers. So, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, have histories of trauma, okay? And, um, you know, it's realizing how we get, so you can get easily triggered by your senses. Just smelling something, just seeing something, all of a sudden it can affect your mood begin to realize that. So just learning how to cope with some of those things and recognizing those and just coping skills in general. Okay. And people want to process issues of grief and loss, substance abuse issues, again, trauma recovery, and some people parenting skills and just adjusting to major life changes. Sometimes it could just be you come down with an illness that has caused you know, some limitations in functioning or even if you get married or get engaged, sometimes there's a life changes that need adjusting. So some people seek therapy for those. Okay, so I'm getting into some of the types of therapies, okay? Because then as you're seeking therapy, you know, kind of ask some of these questions to yourself, you know, why would you want to go to therapy? 
And then also, so, you know, what are my choices? So some of your choices are acceptance and commitment therapy is one type of therapy, which focuses on acceptance and mindfulness techniques paired with commitment and behavioral changes strategies to increase psychological flexibility. So it's almost like within the cognitive behavioral realm of ideas and also combining some of the mindfulness. Another type is just straight up behavioral therapy. So this is kind of like where people are familiar with Pavlovian dogs and you know, pairing up a behavior and behavior changes. So it's, it's, more, it's just more action oriented. The cognitive therapy focuses on changing the client's way of thinking, which may result in changes of behavior and feeling. And there's several different types of cognitive therapy. So you have the rational emotive behavioral therapy, focus a little bit more emotions and thoughts, feelings, and actions all kind of work together. And this is a very good cognitive behavioral person's thoughts, beliefs, and how they influence a person's mood, actions, with the goal of shifting thinking and behavior for better outcomes. Dialectical behavior therapy, I really like this, um, combines cognitive behavioral techniques for emotional regulation, as well as includes reality testing, distress tolerance, and acceptance, and mindfulness techniques. It has really good coping skills. So it was designed more for people who are suicidal, but um, and suicidal behaviors, so and parasuicidal behaviors. But I like the way they have the different techniques because they have this uh, really basic, simple skill. Plus, it also focuses on the emotional regulation and about emotions and recognizing emotions and how they are and developing a language of emotions. A lot of times we see things very black and white and then this way you begin to get that gray and have other words and terms to say for, you know, I'm sad or I'm depressed. So and then this maybe, well, today maybe just more, a little bit stressed versus more depressed. So it's finding that language. Um, the EMDR, which is the eye movement desensitization and food processing. So it uses the eye movement bilateral movements in order to process traumatic um, memories. So it kind of pairs up the emotions with, um, with the traumatic event. Because a lot of times people disconnect those two. So it's putting that together. It's very intense um, type of therapy. I've done it and people request it and they start it. And you know what, it gets to be very intense and you're not really ready to um, do trauma recovery work, it, direct trauma recovery work. It can be very overwhelming. Um, internal family systems therapy. I like this because it's not just about families. It has to identify multiple subpersonalities. Because a lot of times other therapies do not recognize the different parts that we have. We have different parts. So it's looking at who are those parts in us? Who is the person present? Okay, so it's looking at that some people go down in the basement and some other parts of ourselves are the ones who are present. And looking at which parts are actually interfering or helping and learning how to coordinate that. And then psychodynamic, that is the regular Freudian type of therapy. And somatic experiencing, this is really awesome. And there, people are doing it more and more because especially um, some of the contributions of the, um, Bethel van der Kolk, you know, the body keeps the score. So it's really recognizing how the body and, um, you know, sometimes we don't address certain things, but they come out in our body. And, you know, some pain related issues, some other illnesses, real illnesses, real symptoms, but sometimes they do have an emotional connection. And then traditional group therapies, couples therapies, and then the other ones of art, play, body, breath, and energy work. Okay, so I also wanted to get into that as you're looking for a therapist, okay, so it's like, what, why are we going to go to therapy? You know, what are the types of therapy available? Then it's also when you look at somebody, you see that they have all of these letters behind their name. So I'm just kind of try to break this down. So in groups here, so social workers, these are usually then what you know you find with somebody seeking you. Like I'm an LCSW, it's so a licensed clinical social worker. So that has to do um, you go for your regular social work licensing, and then you have to do extra time with clinical work in or and another testing to get that designation. So these are some of the terms used when you find a social worker to do your therapy. And the other thing is that a lot of insurance companies prefer to pay the social worker than the PhD psychologist. So, you know, sometimes that influences on what your decisions are. Can we just take a, a pause for just maybe a second, sure. Yvette? And 
with all those various types of therapy that you talked about, right? So, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy and eye movement therapy and all the others. Um, and I'm, I'm going to guess that I know your answer, but is there a preferred method that, you know, if you're a trans person, you're looking for a therapist, is there a preferred, you know, and, and they list like in their psychology today profile, and they say that, you know, I specialize in cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, is there a particular type of thing that you should be looking for? Right. And I, I think that most therapists are tend to be a little eclectic. They combine different pieces. Um, and like I said, I think a transgender person comes to therapy for many reasons and not just gender. So I think it depends why you're coming to therapy, you know, um, basic cognitive behavioral therapy though, you know, that helps because you begin to connect how thoughts, actions, and emotions kind of work together. So if you want to do some kinds of changes, okay. If you have like trauma, you know, you have trauma, well, then it may be some trauma recovery work. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to you know, work on the trauma itself. And I know a lot of transgender people being able to get the histories and just keeping secrets and just being, you know, not being able to be your authentic self, you know, there's a lot of trauma involved with that. And then sometimes some trauma after you have come out as well. So, you know, some trauma recovery work, which is also skill building. Um, and um, just, you know, just some of the mindfulness skills, which are very important also. So I think if you want like a basic therapy, the cognitive behavioral is that if somebody is truly of the true cognitive behavioral orientation, it's a lot of homework, okay? Because a lot of people use those skills and, you know, in an eclectic manner, as I do, um, because some of the people who have said that they really want that, and I start laying out, well, this is what you need to do. You know, it's a lot of homework in between sessions. And some people don't want to do that. Their lives are busy enough and they don't want to have to sit there and go through okay. the gap and what did I think? What did I think? What do I believe? So it's very comprehensive. So usually a PhD psychologist is going to put you through doing the pure bread cognitive behavior. Okay, great. Thank you. And then part of our alphabet soup here, so we have the, um, the family therapist, marriage counselors, and then you can also see some people have an LPC, which is a licensed professional counselor. So they may have one of these master's degrees here, and then they go for their licensure and then they end up being an LPC. As far as psychologists, these are the degrees that are associated with the psychologist. And for substance abuse, there's three different levels of addiction counselors. And then there's also pastoral counselors who have um, credentials for therapy. So um, the MDiv is, is very popular around here, especially because a Moravian has that degree. Um, so quite a few people pursue that. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's about religion. This is what the degree is. There's a lot of people who are um, very good therapists that has nothing to focus on spirituality, religion, unless that is what you're looking for. And I also wanted to add some of the nursing type things here because it's becoming more popular than um, the nurse practitioners also. And those can prescribe um, your psych psychotropic medications as well as the psychiatrist. So if you need medications, those are the people who do that. Um, there's some nurses also that do, do therapy. So those are some of the degrees. Okay, so now it's questions to have a clinical therapist, okay? And there's just some basic things. So what are your credentials? Now that you know what the credentials are about, then it's like you can ask because you know what you're looking for. What are your specialties? Okay, so kind of like Corinne said, what is kind of like your focus? You know, some people, you know, um, they focus on like the cognitive behavior, other people, you know, maybe some kids and play therapy. So, you know, what are your specialties? What professional organizations do you belong to? And I think for a transgender community, this is really important because, you know, knowing WPATH or becoming a member of WPATH, I think it's important because you keep up with standards of care. Right now, I also have a mentor through WPATH and he's really teaching me a lot of different things and things that are available um, for the transgender community. So. It is a very good um, resource, especially when you find looking for somebody that's going to address people in the transgender um, community. How long have you been conducting therapy? So, you know, how many years have you been in practice? And what experience have you had in treating transgender individuals? And some of these things you can get um, 
probably if they're like in an office and not by themselves and it's the group you can get that from the front desk person who will say some of these things also you can look in back at your insurance cards it's there they usually have um, a behavioral health lines and then you can also find out who are some of the providers i've done that for some people and you know i get the list for them because sometimes people just don't want to have to deal with that so i'll call and get the list and just they email it very easy and then i forward it myself. so so an issue that we hear about often is that um and, and we're working with a client right now in this place where they say you know i can't find a therapist who accepts my insurance and that is true there's some of those okay who do that and that's why the importance of looking at the number behind your insurance card because then they'll give you the list of who are your providers and also they'll break them up for you which is nice if you're asking you know, who are your phd people who are your you know clinical social workers and they'll send you all of that um then it's calling those places. And right now, since COVID, it's been very hard for people to get into therapy. It's very difficult, yeah. um, unfortunately. Is it appropriate though, where you know maybe you don't have insurance or you, know, you, you find a therapist that you think is absolutely the right person for you, but they don't accept your insurance, um, where you can negotiate for cash on that sliding scale? I mean, it's, it's okay to ask, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Because then, you know, some of them will do this. Like, I think you have to realize there's a lot of times when they get reimbursed from the insurance, it's not the full amount that they're asking. So, you know, it's kind of like already kind of like a side piece. So they can just request what, what they are receiving from the insurance company, which is a lot less than what they are billing. And they still make it. You know? Yeah. So, so their, their published rate might be, I don't know, let's say $100 a session. But in the reality, if the insurance company is paying them 75 That's right. So yeah. they can ask you for 75 Yep. able to work that. And some of them will do payment plans as well, which is important. You know? But like I said, a lot of times, you know, if they have a front person, they can answer all those questions. For you. But the idea is that also when you decide to go to therapy, you know, you don't want to have to be burdened with like, you know, I'm trying to get better or trying to do something, improve something, change something. And then I have to worry about, you know, the finances of it and not, you know, having to stop treatment for that. I am very, very fortunate that I'm here and, um, you know, here at Comprehensive Health Services, we do not bill for our therapy sessions, okay? So people, as long as they're a patient of our practice here, you know, they receive their, those services. So, which is, which so, is nice. And so for those who, who live or reside in our general service area, if they're getting their hormonal care through comprehensive health, they get your services included. Yes, yes, they do. Yeah. Awesome. And then what's really nice here, and I'm gonna get into this with a little bit with the letter writing, you know, also working like as a group with Dr. Collip and Nick and, and Angie now has joined us. And it's really nice because when people come to me for letters, okay, um, you know, I'll hold on on that because I'm gonna get into that a little later. We'll go back to interviewing the potential therapist. <laughs> okay. Um, and how do you protect the confidentiality? This is important. Do you have other people in there? So do they have office people? Do they have other therapists? Do you have cleaning people? You know, you have to be careful with charts and how they're left around. So it's important to ask about that, you know, about your confidentiality. How long is each session? Are there exceptions to this? And, has, and then kind of like, this kind of stuff, you can find it online, but you can also ask, has anybody filed a formal complaint against you? Have you been censored by a professional organization? So um, we get an idea if there's been some ethical violations there. And if you were in crisis, would you be able to reach you? How do you handle crises? I'd say okay, so some people have coverage. Like for myself, when somebody else will take my calls, you know, that come through. Um, but because we're in a practice, it's nice and we work as a group because I can, you know, also Nick can handle some of those things. And so working in a team, you know, I can go on vacation pretty much be okay. And what is your policy about missed sessions? Because some people, you know, they charge less than 24 hours cancellations. So no, you know, what kind of contract they're getting into with the therapist. Um, what is your policy about physical contact with clients? It should be um, no sexual contact, but sometimes, you know, that's okay because there's some people who want to hug, you know, oh, COVID has put a lot of that on hold, but there's some people who do like that and, um, and that they need it. Like you can even see like when they need it and that 
they kind of want to make that move. So kind of like, you know, I'm a person who feels good with getting hugged from time to time, but I do hope to get that. And, you know, it's very important. I lived alone for many, many years and I've made a point to my sister. I said, do you realize I don't get hugged? I don't get touched very often, you know? And she's like, I never thought about that. And it's just like, yeah. So when people come to therapy, sometimes that is the only place that they're getting that hug and that touch. So that's why, you know, asking that question, it doesn't mean it's necessarily it's sexual in nature, the contact. Um, what is your policy about contact outside of the sessions? Okay, so not just the crisis, just other contact as well. Do you provide vacation coverage? Like who's going to cover for you? What happens if one of us decides to terminate without the other agreement? Okay, so it is like a contractual agreement, but I always say that, you know, the client is really in control of the situation, you know, and they are the ones to determine A and determine if the relationship continues. The therapist, if they see that has something that could be remedied, that maybe there was something the therapist said it was misunderstood, you know, it's so always try to remedy those issues first. And then if really you find that there's no way of solving that or having that kind of trust again, well, you know, you have the right to, be, you know, you don't have to feel obligated to stay there. Because sometimes some people feel like, oh, you know, it's like, yeah, you can break up with your therapist. And do you think you can help me? And I think that's very important because you come up with your needs also, you know, being part of being transgender also, you know, some of that, can you help? Me? You know, and I don't think that's a bad question because some people may say right out, you know, I'm not really good at this. I'm, you know, I'm limited. This is what I can do and this is what I can't do. And it's better to get that up front than you starting to invest money and building a relationship with someone and you realize this person can't really help you. Is there anything I should know about your services that I didn't think to ask about? So, you know, the therapist is kind of seasoned, he will know that. Um, there's sometimes, you know, I did a lot of more trauma recovery work before. Um, and with that, I always, especially in the first session, people would come and start, you know, putting it all out there, information, you know, and I say, you know, this is a relationship build, you know, and a lot of times because boundaries have been violated and stuff, especially people have had sexual trauma, it's like, you know, I set those limits and say, that's a lot of information put out for first time meeting somebody. It's like, yeah, I know I'm a therapist, but it's also teaching that, you know what I mean, of, you know, let's let's limit that right now, you know what I mean, and just kind of, you know, how to build that relationship, you know? So some of those things, you know, or what is your style? Okay, I'm a person who asks a lot of questions. And sometimes some people are okay with that, and some people are not, you know, and some people have, Many people have told me that those are my therapists look at me and I'm like, well, how do you get any work done? And somebody's just looking at you and, you know, you're trying to build a relationship. So it is about relating. Okay. And then some trans specific questions. What is your experience working transgender non-binary clients? I've had this to that before. What percentage of your client base is transgender or lesbian, gay, bisexual, or queer? Are you connected to the transgender LGBT community? Do you know of transgender LGBT resources and services? So not necessarily mental health focus, which I get people asking me about different social type things and other resources that are, that are available. So, you know, it's important that that person has some knowledge of that. Um, and also, do you have a good working relationship with psychiatrists and other mental health providers who are transgender LGBT savvy? So I do ask, questions of, you know, to doctors and stuff, are you comfortable with that? And then, you know, then I can tell people, oh, you know, this person is, you know, good with transgender. So this, this, this brings up a, just a, a thought in terms of, so if you're a, a licensed clinical social worker like yourself, you don't have the ability to prescribe, correct? Yeah. So, you know, if, if I needed an antidepressant or I needed whatever, um, how does that work with, you know, if I, if I needed an antidepressant and you recommended that for me, um, how, how does that work? I'll make a referral. You know, I look at your insurance and I look at, like I said, I, I'll call the insurance company myself and get the information, say this is available. And if I know the people, I said, I know this, I know this, I know this, this one's not good, this is okay. And then go from there. And I also will make the referral myself. Like I'll do the intake and then especially within our network and send out the referral. Um, we are having a, um, 
a, a psychiatric nurse practitioner starting. She's already started, but she's in her training over at the inpatient unit, but she'll start seeing patients here in May. So we'll have that available for our people as well. So. But, but for example, I mean, I mean, we have people that come on these seminars from as far away as, you know, California, Alaska, and Hawaii, right? So if, um, and some states are different. Psychologists in some states can prescribe. Okay. But generally, like if you, you, you could email my family doc to make a recommendation about a prescription. Yes, you can do that. And like I said, I, I, I will do, you know, the referral myself, whatever information, make it easier, you know, whatever is going to make it easier for the client, you know, because sometimes, okay, so you're depressed, you're upset, you're, you know, to start making phone calls and starting to go through all that, it's a lot. So, so I try to at least buffer that as much as possible. Thank you. And what training do you have in working with transgender, lesbian, gay, bisexual, leather, polyamorous? You know, so a lot of people, you know, they don't, you know, okay, so they know LGBT, you, okay, but then sometimes, you know, all the other, um, other things that are there too. So, are there love interests? So, how are they with that and how comfortable are they with, you know, with that type of thing? Okay, so then after you do your, interviewing your person. So now you found out, you know, why I want therapy, what can I choose, what type of provider I want. So, and you did the question, so what are your impressions? So some of the things to think about is, did I feel safe and reasonably comfortable? Did I feel understood and taken seriously? And I want to add that some of these questions I would ask when making the appointment, can I make some questions now instead of taking your first session that you're paying for? And, you know, having to pay that just to get basic things to see if I'm going to stay or not. So it's like maybe just filter through some of these questions, maybe three or four that are most important to you. And, you know, see if you can get those questions answered even before making the appointment. Um, I felt understood and taken seriously. I was treated respectfully. We agreed about the nature of the problem. This feels like it could be a good match. So here also, as you go on, maybe the first, second, third sessions, kind of look at, you know, some of these questions to ask. Um, my questions were answered adequately. My treatment goals were addressed, okay? Because you have to come into the mutual treatment goals. And sometimes, and I've seen it, that I, I recognize a certain problem that is a big problem, okay? Probably at the base of what they're identifying as a problem. But, you know, I have to go with, where the client wants, you know, what is their goal? What they, what do they see as the problem? And as we go along, it's just like, then you're able to incorporate the you consider looking at this part of it, you know, and realizing that it kind of, your problem is a little deeper than what you originally came in for. The individual is clinically qualified, has the qualifications for what you want to address, can afford it, and it gets there with reasonable ease. Again, transportation, you don't want to be all stressed out. You're already stressed looking for help. You don't need to get more stressed with just trying to get to the help. Um, and then your overall impression of the person is, you know, good, fair, or poor. Okay. So fouls, fumbles, and red flags. Okay. So these are some of the things which are kind of really more directed to the transgender community. Okay. So when a therapist, okay, so education burdening. So the therapist expects the client to provide education on transgender issues. And, you know, some people, and I've heard other therapists say, well, you know, it's getting right asked. And it's just like, well, you can ask certain things, you know, but at some level, if you're going to continue working with that client and that population, you need to get your education and know what's going on and not necessarily say that exactly all those things pertain to each and every transgender person. You know what I mean, so you have to realize how it, you know, it is flexible. Um, Gender inflation, uh, objectifying gender. So the therapist fails to acknowledge the client's issues beyond gender. And that's what I wanted this presentation to be about, you know, finding not only a gender therapist, you know, some of the issues that are here in this, in this little section here, it's more directed to transgender community, but also in general, how to get a therapist that can address your mental health needs that you know what you're looking for. To address. So, you know, again, going back to the initial quote, you, it's the balance of both. Gender narrowing, the therapist has a limited view on gender in general. Some types of co comments include assumptions on the right and wrong way of exploring gender and gender expression. Red flag, bye, I'm out, okay? So that's, you know, they have to go with you with where you are. 
Okay. And, um, you know, there's some things that I have, you know, help people because some people don't realize um, sexual orientation versus gender, you know, I'm trying to clarify some of those things. So giving information, equipping people, it's not saying that they're right or wrong, you know, it's kind of like, you know, what's the difference with certain things is one thing versus saying, well, you know, this is it or should be this way, you know, again, time is all. Gender avoidance, okay, therapists avoid gender related issues and concerns due to lacking education on gender and gender related issues. So again, going back to the education, but this time the person instead of trying to get it from the client is now totally avoiding anything that has to do with that, with gender. So if you're going into therapy to address that, um, again, this is not a good match. Gender generalizing, generalizations, um, the therapist makes assumptions and generalizations about gender as well as transgender non-binary individuals. Okay? Um, because some people do not recognize the non-binary individuals, you know, they just see it as they either, you know, male, female, transgender, but then they don't realize that there is that ambivalent area that people are able to flex whichever way they want, you know. And some people are like, well, I don't get it. They're like, there's nothing to get. It's just this is where they are, and just kind of meet them where they are. And the therapist demonstrates the lack of appreciation for diversity within the clinical community. So it kind of goes back to what I'm saying that there is a diversity within the community itself. Gender repairing. So these are the scary ones of um, therapist focus on fixing and curing the gender identity. You know, your problem all has to do with well, this tap out advertising as well. You know, therapist stigmatizes transgender individual and their identity. So, and also all your problems. Would be fine if you didn't have that. You know, you didn't really have to come here. So, so in this area, um, you know, I know that often, you know, like the instead of the term conversion therapy, which is really you know what it is, but people will use the term reparative therapy because it sounds better. Are there any other buzzwords that maybe we should be looking out for? Well, those are the two that I mainly see, but it's also seeing some of the attitudes. Okay, the other thing is also, you know, when you go into the office, you know, what do you see? Is it welcoming? You know, is it is the you know the setting, you know, tends to be welcoming. So right now in my office, I do have a transgender flag on my table over here. So I use that uh, kind of like as my tablecloth kind of thing. So I have that. Um, I have um, the crayon book red. So it's about it's like a children's book, but it's really cool because it kind of tells you to be yourself. And the best of all, I have my picture of. Um, Christina Jorgensen, because, you know, you know, I have, I say that I have a transgender story because I remember seeing Christina Jorgensen as a child and it was like in the sixties. And then um, my mother saying, um, you know, she's not a woman. I remember saying to myself, she's a beautiful lady. And I'm saying she's beautiful. And I told my mother, I go, she's a lady and she's very pretty, you know, and I remember saying that. So, um, you know, so I have a picture of her here because, you know, it, it just reminds me of, you know, to me, I guess I always, you know, you are who you are, you do your gender, you know, who you present yourself to be, yeah. but that's fine with me, but I, you know, so that's why I have her picture here too, for, for me. Anything else? No, nope, there you go. That's okay. good. And then here, um, the pathology is um, belief that trans cause of all the mental health issues is trans gender, the point gender. Okay, so gatekeeping. So here we have um, a big difference here in addressing things. So when consider, considering gender affirming hormone therapy, there are two types of providers. Okay, and we're talking about here your doctors, your endocrinologists, those who require psychosocial assessment that documents persistent, well documented gender dysphoria. dysphoria. And this model limits access to gender affirming care. The alternative to this model is the informed consent model. Now, you know, I, I'm so glad that Dr. Pollock here uses the informed consent model because I think, you know, there's some places and there's a lot of abuse in that, um, oh, you, as, as some therapists, oh, you have to see me X amount of times before I'll even write you a letter, you know. Um, which I just think is unfair. And especially your resources are limited and you're paying out of pocket for this person. Now you have to go so many times just to be able to get a letter to go see an endocrinologist to get hormones started. So um, it's nice the informed consent model. 
um, because it limits his gatekeeping. And then I find myself that I don't like, you know, being associated with some of that, you know. And as I had started saying earlier, you know, I'm very fortunate here. By the time somebody comes and sees me, you know, Dr. Cobb says that they're ready for surgery. So it's like, and, and I could see the difference because when people come in, you can see, you know, trying to make a best impression, trying to, and I just say, you know, I'm just getting the information so I can write a letter for you. I said, you know, Dr. Carl says it's, you know, all clear. You can see the body language of, you know, the, the relief. It's just like, yeah, you don't have to present. You don't have to do anything particular. We're just going to kind of get through some of your gender history and what we can get, you know, the insurance company to pay for things and, you know, keep it moving. So it's probably worthwhile just to kind of take a little step back and talk about the difference between informed consent and WPATH, right? So informed consent is really about trusting the trans individual that they know who and they know what they are. And um, it's really about informing them about um, the potential risks associated with hormones or with surgery so that they can make a good and informed decision. Whereas WPATH is all about um, in, the intention is to make sure that the patient is ready for all of these things, but the impact can often be a delay in those therapies because, you know, and, and it, it is open to interpretation to your point that, you know, some therapists, you know, I know that my therapist, they offered to write me a letter, they followed WPATH, but, you know, they offered to write me a letter in four sessions, which was probably fine for me, right? But, you know, I know other people that has been 20 and I don't know other people that, you know, it's been in one. And it really is just a matter of, you know, you need to advocate for yourself. This is something we talk about with healthcare all the time, is that it's very important for the transgender individual to advocate for themselves with their healthcare providers. And I think it's sad that it's difficult to do that for them. Because so many years you had to keep secrets. You had to keep, you know, you don't say anything. So it's kind of hard to advocate for yourself. And, um, and, and that's what I'm saying. I'm very fortunate in the role that I am because it's like, yeah, you can come see me and never have to come back again. Just take your letter and go, you know? And it's like, and you can see the relief. And some people are like, oh, no, no, but I want to come back. It's like, oh, you can do that too, you know? So it's like, you know, you have choices. There's freedom in that. So gatekeeping happens when health professionals place unnecessary and unfair hurdles in the path of permitted care and require trans and gender diverse patients to who, who they are, we are, and that we really or need access to medically affirming care. So again, it's kind of like what Corinne had said, you know what I mean? They have to prove, and I, I don't like that. You know, I, um, it's, it's just very uncomfortable because it's a whole power dynamic. You know, and like Corinne said, you know, to advocate for yourself with some people that have had very early and bad experiences with people in power um, being mistreated, it's really hard to speak up for yourself. So if you have a friend or somebody that tends to be a little stronger that way, you may want to have them along with you to kind of come alongside you to kind of nudge you along or even say, you know, say hey, you know, are you okay with this? Okay, so what can gatekeeping look like? Okay, provider refuses to take on trans or gender diverse patients and clients. Um, require unnecessary steps in order to access gender affirming care, men mandating a psychiatric or endocrinologist assessment for all patients, delaying gender affirming care without a clear health-based reason or for reasons of watchful waiting, as they try to say. But again, that's like, you know, taking power away. A well-established um, conversion practice, okay, to see if you work. Good. So, you know, when you begin to see that and you see a therapist doing that, it's just like, uh, it's not good. Not providing all the information or answers as to why a particular decision has been made. So let's say, oh, you know, we need to wait, we need to work on this or something. It's like, you know, transgender people know that they're transgender for so many years. Now they're finally saying, I, I want to be myself. And it's like, then you're saying, no, and, and, and that's not right. Requiring trans and gender diverse people to adopt a binary identity or choosing to accept or learn about non binary identity. So again, here you have a therapist that kind of is in that nature and trying to steer you. So here we have some of those conversion kind of things, you know, so, you know, trying to make you fit into a box and saying these are the only options. 
require invasive and unnecessary examinations or testing in order to access care. So this may be like other um, doctors or even like psychiatric and needing all these evaluations. So now you have to get a psychiatrist. You know how hard it is to get a psychiatric appointment? You know, sometimes you have to wait six months or more. So what, you're going to have to keep staying and paying this therapist until finally you get the psychiatric evaluation as well. And so, you know, so all those types of hurdles, you know, some of the gatekeeping and it's just, for me, personally, it's very uncomfortable. I don't like, but it's out there. People engaging in conversion, you know, therapy. Any discussion of rapid onset gender dysphoria, because then that's also kind of somebody who's in the, um, the conversion therapy kind of thing. So it's like, you know, this just came on, you know, we just didn't bear. Um, overinflation of regret rates, okay? So then you have some people who would tell you, and there's there's plenty online and some pretty little famous faces that um, tend to um, keep saying, you know, about the regrets and how many people already have regrets of, you know, um, beginning transitioning and doing or transitioning. So some of those things too. Okay, so letters and letter writing. So what's happening now that it, I've noticed and I've heard, okay, is that there's more and more people writing letters, okay? So the idea is that you need to have a good quality letter um, to, to take to your surgeon. And also in the one um, probably the past session that I attended in December, it was an ethical session. And there are some things that I list here that I was putting in my letters anyway, but then they brought up and said, you know, these things are important. And some of the, People question why are they important? So we'll go through that now. Um, make sure your therapist comments on how, why you decided the surgeon expectations for the procedure. Because a lot of surgeons want to know, well, why are you coming to me? So it's kind of like, you know, that the person did some research. It doesn't have to be anything specific, like, you know, in the letter, but this is they should spend time researching, blah, blah, blah. And there's some patients that come specifically, I want this procedure to be like this. So, you know, it's kind of like the research done. This was the piece that came up in, in that um, session where people were like, well, why would they ask about your social and economic support? Well, because there's other expenses involved with transitioning. Okay, So when you go get your surgery, sometimes you have to stay in some hotel for a week. You know, you don't usually stay in the hospital the whole time. You know, so what do you have? Did you save up enough money that, you know, you can take off time from work as you're doing all this? Also, who's going to take you to and from surgery? who is going to help you out, you know, as you're recovering, you know, help you get your meals to you and do different things for you. Um, so those things are important. So it doesn't mean that it's eliminating or, you know, coming or becoming a barrier, but that the therapist communicates that somehow in the letters. And then, you know, it just looks, it makes the case so much stronger to insurance companies with the surgeon that, you know, this person is ready. Okay. They have considered all these. And I think that so this is a perfect example of where, you know, working with a therapist can really be helpful, right? So whether you're in an informed consent model or in a WPATH model, right, is that, you know, and I know that I've seen it where people get, you know, sort of this very um, romanticized, you know, thought about like, well, this is what hormones are going to do for me, or this is what surgery is going to do for me. And at least in my experience is that, you know, these things don't necessarily make gender dysphoria or stigmatization go away. And so, um, you know, where a therapist can come in is to help you navigate those things. The, the therapist can come in in terms of helping you to navigate, understanding that, well, let's just make sure that you have a good set of support around you when you do have your surgery. Um, because some surgeons require you to stay within, you know, 30 minutes of their hospital for a month, yeah. right? For better or for worse. And so, you know, that requires a lot of logistical support to make those things happen. Yeah. So, you know, so some of those, you know, those types of things. So again, this is not intended to be a barrier, but it just really, you know, you know, some doctors can say that's not present in the letter. They could say, you know, this is not enough information. So again, back to the drawing board, another visit with the therapist, another letter. Because some therapists also charge a separate price for the letter, too, which is not fair. Um, their experience in treating transgender clients. So also that's that's a piece that, you know, that the surgeon knows that they didn't just go to anybody. They, they went to somebody who knows the transgender community and, you know, their needs and has done this before. So also therapist um, willingness to be available for questions. So, you know, they're making themselves and their contact information available um, to, you know, discuss things with the surgeon as well. Because 
you know, it may seem like that there's a lot of things there, but the idea is that you know, at times if the letter doesn't have that, like I said, then it's back to the drawing board. Okay, going back to the therapist, we do, we do. And then I can, again, that's more delay and delay in, you know, towards becoming your authentic self. Okay, so the informed consent, what it is it? It's starting the early 2000s, a means of depathologizing gender diversity, reduces barriers to medical care for transgender, gender diverse, and non binary individuals seeking gender affirming hormone therapy. The informed consent model emphasizes partnership and self determination, tailors care to the individual's needs, so it's not just a cookie cutter model, reduces unnecessary barriers, acknowledge and accept by W has as an alternative of, um, means of obtaining gender affirming hormone therapy. You know, there's the other thing with the WPATH is, which I've learned from my mentor that, you know, you can do, um, he was telling me about a um, patient feminization, you know, how even though they're trying to add that in the next standard of care, which I was aware of, he said that there's already a statement in place that you can put that in and see if the insurance company will cover, you know, facial feminization. So I thought that was, you know, so knowing some of those things, some of those other little pieces that are not right there in the standards of care, but, you know, what has been added and updated, what are some of the statements and platforms and different things before the next revision comes out. Um, the clinician will initiate gender affirming hormones as long as the patient, um, as long as the patient is able to fully understand the potential benefits, known risk, and unknown risk of gender affirming hormones, and kind of bring them over that. And then we have the patient's capacity to provide consent. Okay, so that's part of it. And but horm it's not hormones on demand. Okay, so the, you know there is a whole medical process. There is like going through the risks, the benefits, and all of that other stuff. So it's not just like you know, oh, you're informed consent. Okay, so I want my hormones. I want it now. So it's you know having a balanced look at you know what is available. Okay, may accompany a referral to a mental health professional to provide supporting counseling. So may accompany. Okay, a referral. So it doesn't mean that that has to come first. Is saying that later on, I was, it was very interesting because I attended a surgical, um, WPAP surgical um, conference recently, and I, I was fascinated. And I was just very impressed with this one surgeon in, I guess he's out west, I'm at Washington, Oregon. And it was somebody who was a multiple personality, and um, he did give her her gender affirming surgery, you know, I and mean, he worked through and made sure. You know, she had the support, you know, and the background and mental health counselors that were competent in treating that and gave her her care, which I think is awesome, you know, I mean, because there's some people who get denied for just being depressed at times. So people are just saying, oh, we need to work on that more, that that person went through, you know, to help that that client. I, 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 was, I was very impressed by that. So, you know, in that sense, that would be what, you know, meant to you. Know? Okay, so fan, finding an ally, okay? So just gonna get into generally what's a good therapeutic relationship, okay? So mutual trust, respect, and caring. Um, general agreement on the goals, again, going back to your decision-making, mutual engagement, the work of treatment. So the therapist is just as enthusiastic with you as you're going towards your goal. The ability to talk about the here and now aspect of the relationship with each other. Okay, so it's kind of reevaluating the relationship, you know, especially early on, beginning to just kind of, you know, look at, you know, where are we going, where have we been? Okay, freedom to share neg share any negative emotional responses with each other. Okay, so that you're able to feel comfortable, even if you don't like something about therapists, please address it. You know, if not right then and there, go back and address it because. You know, avoiding doesn't help and it doesn't help the what are your therapy goals. Again, here, ability to correct any problems or difficulties that might arise in the relationship. Okay. And then here's some considerations. Okay, so it kind of all goes together here. You know, um, find a therapist you feel comfortable with. Therapies, and this was um from the Sid Grant Institute, which is a trauma-focused organization, and they put this list out. So this is it's nothing original for my part. Um, therapy is not an easy process, and your therapist is not there to be your friend. You know, and I say that a lot of times. It's like I'm not here to be your friend, and we get along. We have 
gold to do, you know, and especially if a relationship begins to get a little too chummy, it, that's not already, it stops being a working relationship. Find a therapist who respects your individuality, opinions, and yourself. Find a therapist who will not get upset if you disagree with what he or she has said, but instead encourage you to express yourself when you do not agree. Find a therapist who never minimizes your experiences and always respects your feelings. Find a therapist who will not try to force you to talk about things that you may not be ready for. There's some therapists who feel like, oh, I know where the problem is here and try to go with that when the person's not ready to go with it. So, you know, and you're able to say no, you know, and that, you know, I ask people questions and I ask a lot of questions, but I also preface it with like, you don't have to answer, you know, you can say no or not right now, you know, so you do have a choice. So don't feel like, you know, you're being pinned into something. Because I think to me also therapy is also like a classroom where you learn, you know, those skills about setting boundaries, about asserting yourself, all those things without saying I'm coming here to do communication skills, you know, it's kind of you learn how to do that and then you're able to take it outside of the therapy office. Find a therapist who does not spend time talking about his or her own problems. Those sessions are for you, not for your therapist. I've heard about those types of sessions and I think it's really sad. Um, I had one patient, not a transgender patient, but you know, I guess the therapist, you know, they got paid by um, what clients they saw and this person was a very good client. And this therapist would call this patient and say, you know, why don't you come in? And, you know, I, I even I have to meet my goals. And it's like, it was, it was horrible, you know? And it's like, that is not good, you know? And um, it took her a while, but she did break up with that relationship because it was, it was not a good relationship. Find a therapist who wants neither a friendship nor sexual relationship with you outside of your counseling session. Find a therapist who will help teach you new and healthier ways to cope. Find a therapist who will never make you feel like a failure or cause you to believe that they are disappointing you if you have a slip or a relapse. Okay, so that's very important because sometimes some people withhold things from therapy because then they think, oh, what's my therapist going to think about me? And the bottom line is, you know, communication, communication, communication. The quality of relationship between the therapist and client can determine successful from unsuccessful. So being open and honest, you know, saying about your needs and your wants and, you know, just the basic things of safety, openness, respect, encouragement, privacy, and acceptance, you know, and also for a therapist, especially working with the transgender community is willingness to step out of their comfort zone, you know, that they're willing to do that as well and be uncomfortable, which is, which is nice because then also, again, it's teaching as well how to handle those things. And I saw this little graphic and I thought it was really cute. Okay, I don't know why her eyes are closed or she's pigeon toed, but however, I thought it was really cute graphic of, you know, a good therapist, you know, they ask questions, good listening, mutual understanding of their clients, connecting. What I like here is also, um, they remember what you discussed the previous session. Okay? So I think that's very important. I think a lot of people feel like they're not heard. Um, I sometimes listen a little too much because somebody told me something and it was like a year later and the story changed. And I said, but last year when you told me this, it was blah, 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 blah. And they're like, oh, you remember? It's like, oh, I do. You know? So, you know, so it doesn't have to be a year later that they remember that, but that at least that they, you know, can at least recap or go back and people that you've mentioned say, oh, and that person is your boss. Okay. And you say, oh, Jeremy. Oh, it's like, oh, Jeremy, your boss. And then at least to help you with that okay so that's the basics and like i said hiring firing a therapist not just a gender therapist um so you get the help that you need well i gotta tell you i've never seen anybody go through 52 slides that fast <laughs> even i even <laughs> i can't do that and i'm in the slide business so good well the thing is that they, i don't put much on my slides either yeah so they're, they're, they're clean they're pretty clean Great job, though. So we'll give people a few moments to see if anybody has any questions, but I think you covered everything. Oh, my gosh, you did an amazing job. Yeah. So I'll just take a moment to really thank you, Yvette, and I want to thank you and everybody at Comprehensive Health for being such tremendous allies to the transgender community. We're very excited about the work that you all have been doing over the last few years. And we're excited about doing it, too. I mean, it's, it's really nice, you know, for yeah. a wonderful experience. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's just so wonderful to see the passion. So thank you. So if anybody has any questions, now is the time to put them in the chat because we're counting down the moments here. Um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, Yvette, you know, one of the things that, you know, it's interesting because I've gone to therapy three times. So my wife and I have done couples therapy twice. And then, of course, I've had my own therapist for a while. And I'm just a huge believer. And so, you know, in terms of, you know, you know, they're, you know, my therapists have always been sort of this, you know, disinterested third party who just, you know, make sure that I know the consequences of my decision. And I think it's always been very helpful. So here's a question. If someone is a minor, does a parent have to be involved uh, in the transgender hormone therapy questions? I do believe they do, but I'm going to tell you right out that's why I don't do children. And no, I don't know. I can't give you your straight answer as far as children. I don't do minors for a lot of all of it. I don't do kids in general, period. I don't therapy because of a lot of the complications, you know, the parents. But I do believe that they have to have some kind of involvement. Um, yeah. I think kids over 14, they have a little bit more privilege. I know in mental health, they can do all their mental health decisions at 14 whether they want to take medication or not. Um, so that I'm aware of in the mental health side. But as far as the yeah, so I think that it, it, it varies, this is my understanding, and I'm certainly not an expert, but it varies state to state um, you know, in terms of what you know, the age of majority is and the age of informed consent. Um, but generally speaking, you know, you know, for example, if, if you are looking for a therapist who specializes in um, dealing with minors, um, and if you're in uh, Pennsylvania, we can certainly point you towards some therapists who specialize in working with minors who are trans. Um, um, they are not as thick on the ground as, as uh, therapists that work with adults, though. So you might have to travel a bit sometimes. But um, uh, generally speaking, you know, I think that when somebody is a minor, you know, the more that that parent is involved and the more that parent is supportive, the better the outcome is going to be. Yeah. I was very happy there was a 20 something year old person that came, um, just turned 21 actually, he came with their father. And I, you know, I really like that, you know, that he was willing to be part of this and wanted to be part of, you know, his life um, in this decision. And I thought that was really great. So, you know, seeing parents that want to come and be supportive, that's nice because it makes it easier. It makes it a lot easier transitioning. Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, and I know just in the last couple of weeks, I've spoken to a bunch of moms and one dad who are all, you know, doing their best to support their, their kids. And uh, it's just wonderful to see. So I wish I had had that certainly when I was young. Yeah. All right. Does anybody else have any other questions? We'll give you, you know, another moment or two. Um, if not, um, I have shared Yvette's information in the chat. I have shared a link to this wonderful presentation in the chat as well. And we'll um, put a copy of that link on our Facebook page as well. So make sure you follow us on Facebook. Um, that'll be up tomorrow. We'll also have uh, a copy of this uh, program on our YouTube channel by the end of the week. So uh, refer your friends and your neighbors certainly to it. And um, thank you so much, Yvette. It was just wonderful to have you. Thank you. It was wonderful being here. Yeah. All right. Everybody have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Good night.